How many people out there, let me see a show of hands, have heard about using hyperbaric oxygen for autism? So that's quite a few, probably a third or so. Um, and how many of you think it's complete quackery? Wow, nobody. I, I thought it was. When I first got into it, I went to a conference about a year and a half ago, and they had these chambers at the conference, and um, they were saying it was helping kids with autism, and it didn't make any sense at all to me. I was like, that's complete garbage. Um, and my wife said we need to buy one, and I told her she was crazy, but she, we eventually got one, and we started trying on a, our two children with autism and a couple other children, and saw pretty good re, uh, results, and that came out in a little study that we did. So then we started looking more into it and actually doing research, research on it, um, and that's kind of what we're going to go over today. Um, here we go. This is Isaiah. This is my oldest son. He's almost six now, and he was diagnosed with autism at 18 months of age. We were actually headed overseas. We were going to be medical missionaries, and we um, went to Africa, and we were looking at going there, and then when he was diagnosed, um, we felt it would be best to stay in the States. So um, God has a way of sometimes changing your plans when you think you know what you're going to be doing. So we prepared for years to do that, and um, he changed everything. So this is Joshua. This is my second son, both diagnosed with autism. He was diagnosed um, pretty early, around 12 to 14 months or so. Um, and he's doing very well as well. So I, I got drawn into autism, kicking and screaming. This is not something I would have even thought to do. When um, Isaiah, my older, was diagnosed with autism, I didn't even know really what autism was. I mean, I went to med school. We sort of learned about it, but I really didn't know what it was. I couldn't pick out a kid with autism in a crowd um, before that. So I got dragged into this uh, not wanting to do that. What we're going to talk about um, today is just the use of hyperbaric oxygen in autism. This is to remind you that it's off-label, um, so it's not an approved indication for autism. We're going to talk about the underlying pathophysiology, some of the things we've already heard about in autism, including decreased blood flow to the brain or hypoperfusion. We're going to talk about inflammation both in the brain and the gut of autistic children. Um, then we're going to just talk about how hyperbaric may help those problems that we're finding with the decreased blood flow and the inflammation. We're going to go over just a quick retrospective study that we did. That was our original study on hyperbaric. We're going to talk about um, a study we just submitted for publication last month, a prospective study on 18, on 18 children. And then um, we're going to talk about, is hyperbaric right for your child? If we look at the prevalence of autism, um, this is a slide I put together um, a year or so ago, just looking at different studies. Each of these letters on the slide is a different um, study. And so you can see up until about 1990, the rates of autism were pretty low. This is mainly U.S. data. And you can see since the 1990, the rates have gone up pretty dramatically for whatever reason that is. Um, I like this um, article here. This is a very interesting article from Time magazine from May 2006. And basically it's uh, quoting Tom Insel. And he says when his, do uh, when his brother, who's a physician, was at um, Harvard a child in the hospital, um, they brought all the residents in to see a child with autism. And his quote is, you've got to see this case, you'll never see it again. And obviously we're seeing that a lot more now. Some people don't see it though. Some people think the rates of autism have not been going up. I don't know what they're looking at. Okay, so first we're going to start with decreased blood flow in autism. If you start looking in the literature, there's actually dozens. I probably have 30 or 40 studies at home in my office just on decreased blood flow to the brain in autistic children. And so you'll find this in numerous studies. If you look at this study here, this was published in 2003. And if you look here, this is a normal child. I'd rather call him a typical child, because who's normal? And what they did is they compared um, functional MRI scans to their baseline. So when they had to pay attention to a task, typical children will get an increase in blood flow to certain areas of the brain. And what that does is it gives you more oxygen, gives you more sugar, so now your brain, brain cells can function more. So um, normally, when we're sitting in the room, and if we're just vegging, vegging out and you're not paying any attention to me, your brain is not using a lot of oxygen and a lot of glucose. When you have to focus and pay attention, you're actually going to increase in blood flow. You'll get more oxygen, you get more sugar. And what they found is with these autistic children, they didn't get an increase in blood flow when they had to focus on a task. Okay? If we look at this study, this is a PET scan. It's a very similar findings where they had typical children listen to a tone or generate a sentence, and they got an increase in blood flow to certain areas of the brain on PET scan. And what they found in the autistic children was that actually the blood flow went down. So it went the reverse direction. If you look at this study here, this showed, um, in this study, 86% of the children they studied with autism 
had decreased blood flow compared to typical children. I'll blow this up for you. The decrease in blood flow was not dramatic, okay? It was about 8% less, but it was statistically significant. So what we're finding, um, and this is a different study, just showing decreased blood flow, especially to temporal, temporal lobes in autism. And if you start looking at where the decreased blood flow is in the temporal lobes, it connects to your auditory and visual processing centers. Interesting thing is, as the age of the child gets older, the um, blood flow diminishes further, so it becomes quite profound the older that you get. And this is in your um, handout in the, in the book, okay, so as a table. Basically, um, if you start looking in literature, there's dozens of studies correlating decreased blood flow to certain areas of the brain with clinical symptoms. So if you take Wernicke's areas here, area here, which is involved in language, if you have decreased blood flow there, you tend to get decreased language development. So you can see that if you have an area that's under, under perfused, maybe not getting enough blood flow, you're going to have a little bit decreased oxygen, a little bit decreased sugar perhaps, and this correlates with their um, symptoms. Now, no one has really stopped to say, why do they have decreased blood flow? Um, it's just documented in literature. It's kind of like they're just reporting it. This is um, from a study out of Johns Hopkins in 2005, published by uh, Vargas and her associates, showing inflammation around the blood vessels in uh, a subset of autistic children. They took 11 children who died natural causes, looked at their brain under the, under the microscope, and found inflammation. So you can see where this arrow is there's inflammation surrounding the blood vessel. Normally the blood vessel should look like that, where it has a very thin wall and doesn't have inflammation around it. And so if you start looking in the literature um, at diseases in which you have inflammation in the brain, um, if, you, if you look at Sjogren's, Bichette's disease, encephalitis, Kawasaki's disease, lupus, these are all diseases that have inflammation in the brain that can cause decreased blood flow. So if you look at the study here, this is actually a SPECT scan. Um, and, and the blue arrow here shows the scan um, at baseline, and then after an, event, after an intervention. And the areas that are in red are areas of increased blood flow. The areas in green are decreased blood flow. And you can see an improvement in blood flow after the intervention. Now, what you might think is, wow, that's hyperbaric oxygen doing that. What this was was an anti-inflammatory medicine. So they gave the people an anti-inflammatory medicine, and they got improvement in blood flow to the brain. And then we're going to talk about inflammation of the brain. So this is the study that I alluded to from uh, Vargas out of Johns Hopkins, stub, uh, published in 2005. And what they found is that markers of inflammation were higher in the uh, brain of autistic children compared to typical, typical children. Things like um, MCP, IL-6, these are just markers of inflammation. And when they looked at the brain, the one on the, that's marked A is a typical child, and you can see how that looks. And then if you look at the B, that's an um, autistic child, and they have a lack of, or a loss of Purkinje cells, which is at the orange arrow here. And at the blue arrow, arrow they have a loss of the granular cells. So you can see, um, you don't have to be a doctor to see a difference in the brain uh, of the autistic ch child compared to the typical child. This is a blow up. Um, the areas that are staining in brown are actually um, inflammation in the brain. On the bottom slide, which is marked G, that's the green areas are inf areas of inflammation as well. And so we go back to this. Um, what we think is possibly happen, happening, we don't know for sure, is that the decreased blood flow we're finding in some of these autistic children may be due to inflammation. And you can imagine if you have a blood vessel here that's thicker than it should be, maybe it doesn't dilate like it's supposed to, and you won't get an increase in blood flow. So you can imagine if you're doing speech therapy or whatever therapy you're doing to try to improve speech, but you're getting, not getting adequate blood flow to a certain area of the brain, you may not have an optimal outcome. This is a very interesting study published in 2004, basically looking at functional connectivity. And if you look at the bottom, um, this is a, uh, looking at functional connectivity in a typical ch child. What functional connectivity is is the way that one cell in the brain talks to another cell. And you can see um, that it matches up pretty well in a typical child. If you look at the top slide, um, the signal that goes from one cell and then when it shows up in another cell, there's a, there's a gap. Um, in the middle there. And so it appears in autism at least that the cells are not communicating as well as they should be. And certainly if you have inflammation in the brain, it typically will cause a little bit of increased swelling. There's now two studies in literature published in 2006 looking at um, special MRI scans where they found increased water inside the brain, of, uh, brain cells of certain children with autism. And so what we think is happening is, is the inflammation that's in the brain is leading to decreased blood flow, leading to problems with cells communicating with each other, um, perhaps causing a little bit more water inside cells in the brain. How do we measure that? One of the tests that you can do is something called neopterin. 
Uh, when you tend to have a lot of inflammation in the brain, um, neoptrin will go up and you can measure this in the urine. There's now two studies in the literature. This is one of them looking at neoptrin compared to typical children, um, neoptrin in autistic children. And you can see in orange here that neoptrin levels are higher. So when you have a lot of inflammation, um, the neoptrin level will tend to go up and it's a, just a screening test for uh, inflammation that we often use in clinics. So when I see a child that comes in, we'll get a urine neoptrin level. If it's elevated, um, and we'll know that there's some inflammation. The higher it is, the tends, there tends to be more inflammation. So the higher it is, it helps us to know that the inflammation is present, and then we can do an intervention, i.e. anti-inflammatories or something else to bring the inflammation down.